How's everybody doing? Calvin says, time for more work. Hang in there. Paul says, good, how about yourself? Hey, I'm doing pretty good too. Happy it's Friday. The arc reactor. This is some Iron Man stuff right here. Okay, let's get started. Pretty fast for a set. <laughs> this is actually a brushed DC motor. And this is only a six volt power supply. Believe it or not, believe it or not. Ando Bear says, Donkasaurus. Indeed. Okay. He couldn't have been using the battery in the lab kit. I know, what happened to that thing? I've never known a nine volt battery to, to give up as quickly as that one did. A little disappointing. Okay. He stuck the motor wires into the electrical outlet. I wouldn't suggest doing that. Okay, so we're gonna talk about frequency response as a way to mathematically model systems. I 
think the circuits killed all my I saw you mention that, but I like I can't believe that would happen. Okay. So today we're going to look at a six volt DC brushed motor. So it's like the motor, it's like the DC motor we had in our kit, or we have, but this one's just a little bit beefier. All right. So uh, let us, let's look at this motor. We're gonna observe how it responds. We're gonna gather some data. We're gonna point out some stuff. What does, what's the brushed mean? That means that, on, so the way that a DC motor works is you have to get current to run through the rotor. So like the piece of the motor that's actually spinning, it has current running through it. So it has electrical conductors inside. So the question is like, wait, how do you get electricity to the rotor itself that's spinning? Because if you just like connected a wire, if a wire is going to it, then as the rotor spins, the wire's just gonna spin up and it's gonna break and it doesn't work. So what a brushed motor does is it has these brushes that scrape the rotor and um, it transmits electricity through the brushes and they don't look like a paintbrush they're actually just like a carbon think of it like a pencil that's rubbing on the um but that's how it, it it's it's really interesting that's how it gets electricity to the rotor brushes okay i want to show you we're gonna upload this so what's important here is I have this omega in the code and what omega is it's the frequency so I'm gonna I'm gonna drive the motor in a sinusoidal motion um, and this is gonna be the frequency of the voltage going in and let's see so I'm defining this to be 0.5 Hertz so that means half a cycle per second or one complete cycle every two seconds. So I'm gonna upload this to the board. I'm actually using an Arduino Mega right here, even though an Uno would do the trick. And then I'm gonna plug in the power supply and you're just gonna see this spinning back and forth. And I'm gonna plot the voltage. Okay. So you see two lines, right? The blue line is the voltage that's being supplied to the motor. And it's going like up to five volts and then down to minus five volts. So when you apply positive voltage, it spins in one direction. If you apply negative voltage, it spins the other direction. And so if you take the period from like one peak to the next peak, it's taking two seconds to make a complete peak to peak journey. The red line is the angular velocity of the motor in radians per second. So it's spinning in one direction to like minus, I don't know, minus nine radians per second, which is like one and a half rotations per second. And then it, in the opposite direction, it goes the other way. Now, I'm gonna unplug this for a second because it's just a little loud. But what I want you to recognize, uh, so, so what we just did is we did a sinusoidal forcing test on this system. We provided a sinusoidal input and what came out is a sinusoidal output. And I actually wanna plug it in uh, one more time. And I wanna point out three things to you. Okay, the first thing I want to point out is that the amplitude of the input 
is different from the amplitude of the output. Erebus says LTI system. That's true. We have a linear time invariant system. So the, the input amplitude is different from the output amplitude. That's number one. Number two, what did I want to say? The frequency of the oscillations are the same. So it takes two seconds for the voltage to complete a cycle. It also takes two seconds for the output, which is the angular velocity of the motor, to complete a cycle. So that's the second observation. The frequencies of these signals are the same. The third observation is there's a little bit of delay between the signals, like they're shifted relative to each other. So the blue line's the voltage, right? No, the blue line is the, the motor voltage that's being provided. And you notice the angular velocity kind of delays that. So as I provide more voltage, the, the motor speeds up, but it's kind of lagging behind. So that's the third observation. Okay, we're gonna unplug this really quick and we're gonna bring this, we're gonna write down some of these observations. And I'm gonna do it in this way. Okay, if you have a linear system, in our case, it's a motor, which isn't entirely linear, but mostly, okay? And here's what we're doing. We're providing, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna graph the input to the motor. The input is voltage, by the way. And then over here, we're gonna have our output. So it's kind of like we have the voltage coming in and then we have an output coming out of the system and the output is I'm measuring the angular velocity. All right, so I wanna draw the input signal first. Let's, let's use blue, because that's, that's what the line was in the, the Arduino. And, and it's just going on and on and on. Um, so this is a sinusoid, and let's just write Let's call this input u as a function of time. It's gonna have some amplitude, we'll call it a, times sine of the frequency omega t. So the amplitude is just that right there, the amplitude of the sinusoid, like how high it goes above zero. The frequency well, to determine the frequency, first it's good to look at the time it takes to go from peak to peak or the time it takes to go from like a zero rising to another zero rising. So you could also use here as the period. And why don't we do that? So this is the period T. So the frequency, and we're gonna do this in radians per second omega is two pi over t. So that's the frequency in radians per second. So that's what we're doing. We're providing a sinusoidal voltage signal. And let's look at the output. First, I'm gonna copy the input onto here because it'll make this, so I'm gonna copy that same thing as best I can. Something like this. And what did we notice? that we had uh, something like this. I know I'm not drawing this perfectly, but our output amplitude, let's call it A output, it's different. It was a little larger than the than the input amplitude. And there's also like a time delay. Like if you zoom in right here where they cross zero,
there's a difference between their zero crossings when they're when they're rising. And so why don't we define that time difference? For now, I'm just going to I'm going to call it T offset. And actually, um, yeah, we'll, we'll call it that for now. OK, so over here we wrote uh, the expression for the input. It's just A times sine omega t. Let's do the same thing for the output. So we'll call the output y of t. And I'm going to write this in, um, in this way. No, I'll do it like this first just to make it a little clearer. So it has this amplitude, and then it's also a sine. And notice, the frequency of the sine is the same. That's what we noticed in the experiment. The input frequency and the output frequency are the same, but there's a phase shift, which is, I mean, it's clearest to see by this offset in time. Like the output is lagging the input a little bit. And the way we do that with the sign, the way we shift it is we use a phase angle phi. And something that I can point out right here, if the output signal lags the input, then the phase angle will be negative. So I'll say phi is less than zero. So when you see like a positive or negative phi and they're like, oh, the phase angle is minus 45. Well, we'll get into that in a little bit too. I'm getting like PTSD flashbacks from Mook. Yes, you, you will have done this in Mook. And I'm just gonna tell you right now, we're gonna be working towards a Bodhi plot. I know some people hate Bodhi plots, some people love them, but, but this is kind of what we're working towards here. But just now we're making some, hey, calm down. Right now we're just making some observations, okay? We're just making some observations. Don't, don't be scared. Okay. So I wanna point out Hey, there we go. Bodhi plots were kind of cool. <laughs> Let's talk about the output amplitude a little bit. So in this case, the input has some amplitude. The output amplitude was a little bit bigger. So what I want to define is the amplitude ratio. That's the way that we quantify this difference. The amplitude ratio is, it's this. The amplitude of the output divided by the amplitude of the input. And you know what's interesting? This changes based on the input frequency. Let's go back to the experiment real quick. Maybe I'll plug this in again. Let's calculate the amplitude ratio of this. Um, let's take a guess. Okay, the biggest this gets, let's just make an estimate. Let's say the output amplitude goes to nine. And then the, the input amplitude, let's just say it's, it's five to be simple. Pause this real quick. And this, the frequency that we're doing once again is one half hertz or pi radians per second. So I'm gonna go back here really quick. So, okay, at omega, so this is the input frequency, at omega is pi radians per second. The amplitude ratio, let's call it AR, is approximately equal to nine. 
divided by five. Let's throw this in here. Nine divided by five. Oh my gosh. And I, I didn't do that in my head. I actually plugged it into MATLAB. Check out platform IO brings Arduino into the century. Ooh, thank you. I'll check that out. I'll check that out. Um, okay, let's try, let's try another frequency. I'm gonna love it. Ooh, I'm getting excited. Uh, okay, okay. Let's change the frequency. Let's do, we're gonna quadruple it. It's gonna be two Hertz or four pi radians per second. And what I wanted to show you is that the amplitude ratio is gonna change. All right, let's plug this in. This is gonna be going much faster or it's gonna change directions faster. Let's go to the plotter. Wait, how much does this change really? It looks like the output amplitude is still higher than the input amplitude, I mean, obviously. But is it by a factor of 1.8? I don't think so. What is this, four, this is six. Let's say this is still like five volts, but now the output is like seven. So the output, seven divided by five. So now the amplitude ratio is like 1.4. What if we make the frequency even faster? Let's make it five cycles per second. Much faster, much faster. Okay, so it's, it's, it's not really going anywhere. Okay, look at this, look at this. Remember the input voltage is in blue. The angular velocity is in red. So now the amplitude ratio is actually less than one. We're still giving like five volts approximately, but it's only resulting in close to five radians per second of angular velocity in either direction. Okay, let's unplug this real quick. We'll go back here. So when omega was, what did we try? Oh my goodness. So we tried five Hertz, which is five. So that's 10 pi radians per second. The amplitude ratio, it looked like it was like 0 0.8. It was like a little bit less than the moment. Is the movement to be following the sine wave? No, it, there's no feedback controller. It's just that the blue line is the raw voltage signal. And then we're seeing how the angular velocity responds. Okay, and then we did some frequency in between and it was like seven over five. Okay, so we see that the amplitude ratio changes with frequency, and it looks like the faster the frequency goes, the smaller the amplitude ratio gets. Okay, let's point that out. The other thing we're gonna talk about is the delay. Okay, so we have this offset time, right? It looks like the output is lagging behind the input. So let's talk about so the way we quantify this is we use the phase angle phi, and remember phi is less than zero. We're trying to find the open loop transfer function without knowing anything about the system's internal mechanics. That is a very, very good way of saying it. Nicely done. Now I wanna relate this to this offset time in here. So this is a way you can calculate it. So we're gonna have T offset, T 
times omega. Would we ignore that the negative angular velocity was at a greater value than the positive value? That's a great question. So the reason that the velocities might have different amplitudes on positive or negative, depending on the direction of rotation, it could be a result of how this motor is manufactured. It could just be a manufacturing defect, um, like a misalignment of the rotor, perhaps. Um, or I was going to say maybe an issue with our sampling frequency, like we're sampling at, I'm trying to get 100 samples per second, but we're, we're not like sampling so slow that I think, so I think it's really a manufacturing defect. Slightly tangent, there's a really nice open source software project for closed loop brush lift motors called O-Drive. I'll have to look that up too. Okay, this T offset, the way that we calculate this, it's equal to the zero, I'm just gonna write this out, zero crossing time for the input. And actually, I'm, I'm even gonna add this while the signal is rising, minus, so this is just the T offset. I know, I, I'm writing this all out. Time of the output while the signal's rising. And then we multiply this by omega. So if you look at the graph up above, let's go back up there. I know you might still be writing this. Let's say that, um, so this is the rising edge of the input signal. And here is where it crosses the zero. And uh, I'm just gonna say like this is where T equals T1. I'm just making up some time here is the corresponding point on the output signal where it is rising and crossing zero. Let's call it T equals T2. So T offset in this case is T1 minus T2. And you can tell that this is gonna be less than zero because T2 happens at a larger value of time. It's happening sometime later than T1. So this is indicative of phase lag. Okay. And what I want to do is just like we did with the amplitude ratio, let's do this with some actual data from the motor. And what I want to do is I want to gather some data I wanna bring it into MATLAB so that it's a little easier to manipulate it than just looking at the serial plotter. Um, so we are going to, sure, let's do this. Let's go back here. Let's do this. We're gonna do five Hertz again, the one that we finished with, but I'm gonna change what I print out here. We're gonna do this. So we're gonna print the time, we're gonna print the voltage, and I'm gonna print the angular velocity. Uh, and we're gonna, we're gonna, instead of visualizing this on the serial plotter, we're gonna do the serial monitor. So it's just gonna print out the data. Okay, let's, let's go to the monitor. Let me get rid of this timestamp. What I'm gonna do is I'm just going to do a little copy paste. I know this is not a sophisticated way of getting the data. Even the numbers make a sine wave. You're right. 
It's like watching the Matrix. Uh, okay, we gotta go faster. I think this is enough data to get it. Let's copy this. Make sure it's copied real good. Let's go to Notepad. Let's paste it. Let us save it. Da, 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 da. Where did I save this? I think I had it in a different folder for here. For example, we're just gonna call this 49-2021-motor.txt. All right, let's go to MATLAB. Let's just make a new one. Load. I think I called it 49-2021-motor.txt. Let's save this in the same folder. We have to save this MATLAB script in the same folder I think this is the right place. Let's run it. Is this what I called the text file? There it is. We have it in MATLAB. Okay, the first column of this data is the time. So we'll say T is data column one. And then the voltage is the second column. And the velocity, let's call it omega. No, 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 let's not call it omega. Let's call it, what should we call the angular velocity? We'll call it velocity. The third column. We're gonna make a figure. We're gonna plot the voltage. We're just gonna make a blue line. We're gonna plot the velocity, red line. Line width, we'll thicken that up. Let's have an X label, this is time in seconds. Y label is, actually let's leave that off because we have different values here. I'm gonna do a legend instead. So this is the voltage in volts, that's the first one. And the other one is angular velocity in radians per second. Let's bring that over here. Okay. I'm gonna throw a clear all, close all at the top, even a CLC. Let's run this. Okay. So now we have the data from Arduino in MATLAB. And what I want to do, let's zoom in so we don't have like the whole, the whole thing. But I want to try to calculate the phase lag here um, for this particular one. Because you're going to be doing this in your assignment as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the rising edge of the input. And, and you could pick like any of these. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to pick like this particular sinusoid right here. And this rising edge is crossing zero. I'm going to zoom in. We're just going to do this by eye. So this is the rising edge of the input. Here's the rising edge of the output. So the input, it's like right between 3.42 and 3.43 seconds. So why don't we just call it 3.425? seconds and then for the output maybe I'll call it like 3.481 okay so the offset for this one 3.425 that was the input crossing and then we're subtracting the output crossing and it's a negative number now to get the phase angle at this particular frequency, we're gonna take T offset and we're gonna multiply it by 
the frequency of the input in radians per second. Now, this was five hertz, so five cycles per second. One cycle is two pi radians per second. So it's gonna be five hertz times two times pi. And this is gonna give us the phase angle in radians, phi. So minus 1.7593. This should be, like if you convert this to degrees, so you do that by multiplying by 180 over pi, it should be close to minus 90. Oh, whoops. Minus 100, actually. Okay. So let's go back over here. So when omega is five hertz or 10 pi radians per second, phi was approximately equal to the offset time of minus 0 0.056 seconds times 10 pi radians per second. And we have minus 1.7593 radians. Okay. And this phase angle is going to change with different input frequencies as well. Okay, so let's get back to our big goal here. The goal is to get a model for this motor based on the amplitude ratio and the phase angles that we're getting here. So I want to show you this. What you do is you test a bunch of different frequencies. So this is the input frequency. And let's plot amplitude ratio. And so like we did three different frequencies here. Maybe it's like, um, I'm just making some up. You have like pi, two pi radians per second. Uh, maybe four pi radians per second. So you do a bunch of these and you get the amplitude ratio at each. So that's just the output amplitude at that frequency divided by the input amplitude. And it's gonna do something like this. It goes down over time for most systems. And you do the same thing and, and really you want to try, you want to test like many more points. You do the same thing with the phase angle. You test it at the same points. Um, and your phase angle, I'm just going to draw kind of what it's going to look like. It's going to be mostly like around zero and then as you increase the frequency, it's gonna go down. And then for this particular system, it's gonna level out. Let's put this in degrees for now. So it starts around like zero degrees. At some point, it's gonna be like minus 45 degrees. And then it's gonna settle around minus 90 degrees. Bodhi plots, ah, oh, run for your lives. I know I'm kind of sneaking it in here, but but you're right. We're getting to a Bode plot. Um, now, when you do this amplitude ratio plot, it's most common to convert the amplitude ratio to decibels. And it's also common to plot the frequency on a semi-log 
scale. And so, or, or rather, uh, just on a log scale. And what, what that means is that frequencies that are separated by multiples of 10 are gonna be equally spaced. So you've seen these semi-log plots before. Things just get more squeezed together as you move um, further towards the right, all right? Um, so what I wanna do, I wanna show you what this amplitude ratio plot is going to look like for the motor when you convert the amplitude ratio to decibels and plot this on a semi-log scale. Actually, let's... Actually, how about I... I have this already ready in MATLAB. Bodhi plots never leave me alone. <laughs> That's because they're your friend. It's just because they're your friend. Okay, I'm gonna show you this. We're gonna go back over here. Um, okay, so for this particular motor, maybe I'll make this bigger. I have the input frequency in radians per second. This is not on a log scale yet. Um, so I, I'm just trying increasing frequencies. And on this axis, this is the amplitude ratio. And you see, as I increase the frequency, the amplitude ratio goes down. And that's what we were seeing in our experiment. Now, what happens if you convert this to decibels? So uh, this axis spacing, you see, uh, it looks a little different. This is converting it to log scale. Uh, and I'll include some MATLAB sample code in the assignment that gives you some direction as to how to make a plot like this. But this is the same plot. So to convert to decibels, maybe we'll go back over here really quick. What does it mean to convert to decibels? Well, okay, if you have the amplitude ratio to convert it to decibels, you take 20 times log base 10 of that amplitude ratio. So over here is regular, and this is in decibels. So, so simple as that. And so if you look at this, you see a shape that might look familiar to some of you. It's kind of like flat over here, and then it decreases with time over here. Now this is where the modeling comes in. Okay, it's a little, it's a little inappropriate. Um, okay, <laughs> so let's go back over here. From dynamic systems, if you have a transfer function that looks like this, I'm just going to write this out as k divided by, I'm going to write it like this. This, this might look familiar to you guys. So a transfer function is, you know, it's a ratio of input to output in the Laplace domain. So our output is, in this case, angular velocity of the motor. The input is voltage. And this is a model in the frequency domain that describes uh, this relationship. It, so The amplitude, if you have a transfer function, so this is the connection to modeling. Transfer function G of S.
the frequency response function. So we're going to get to the amplitude ratio and the phase, but we're going to start here. So given a transfer function, if you evaluate it at S equals I times omega, where omega is frequency, hello Pika, and I is the square root of minus one, so it's just the imaginary number I. So if you take a transfer function, any transfer function, and evaluate it at I, at I omega, so it would be G evaluated I omega, you get the frequency response function. Or FRF. FRF. So if you just take a transfer function, plug in I omega, where omega represents the input frequency. That's called the frequency response function. Okay. The magnitude, here's, here's where it gets important. The magnitude of the frequency response function, that's G I omega, is the amplitude ratio. for that system. So the amplitude ratio is the ratio of output amplitude to input amplitude. This is a continuous transfer function that you see. We're dealing with S and not Z. So here we go. If you take the frequency response function, G evaluated at I omega, if you take the magnitude of that, this is equal to the amplitude ratio. If you were to take the angle of this, this is going to be that phase angle phi. Okay, so this transfer function that I wrote up here it turns out that if you calculate the frequency response function and if you get its amplitude ratio and if you get its phase angle, this transfer function does a very good job of modeling the dynamics of this motor, actually. Um, let me show you what, what the amplitude ratio looks like. If you do this, so this horizontal axis is omega, the input frequency. I'm going to plot this on a log scale. So that means like um, maybe the frequency here is 10 to the minus 1. Maybe here it's 10 to the 0, 10 to the 1. So everything's getting like squeezed together. Like these are all separated by a factor of 10, but it's equally spaced on the horizontal axis. So that's a log scale. Um, okay. On this axis, we're going to do the amplitude ratio. But remember, the amplitude ratio is the same thing as the magnitude of the frequency response function. And we're going to do it in decibels. So to convert to decibels, it's as easy as you take log base 10 of that frequency response function and then multiply that result by 20. Okay, this is what the frequency response function is gonna look like. So I'm gonna write G of S again here just for reference. It's K over one over omega C S plus one. And I'll explain what these things mean. So first of all, this is a first order transfer function because it has one root in the denominator. In other words, that's called the pole of the transfer function. It's the root of the denominator. So this has a pole 
at s equals minus omega c. Okay, so let's draw what this looks like. It's gonna be flat, and then at some point, it's gonna curl down and then go at a straight line, just down, 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 down. And the slope of this is 20 decibels per decade. And this is a decade right here. This distance separated by a factor of 10. Is this coming back to you? I know if you take Mook's class, you get to see a lot of this. Um, now, <laughs> yes, and it hurts. Now, here's what's special. The frequency where it starts to turn down, maybe we'll like indicate this here. This happens where omega is equal to omega C. Now, the reason we have a C here, C for corner, they call it the corner frequency. Why do we call it a corner frequency? Because the amplitude ratio at that frequency, it turns a corner and then it goes down with a slope of, oh, I should have put a minus sign here, minus 20 decibels per decade. How can a unit change? You have to be a little more specific. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, now, this amplitude here, so the height of this part above zero decibels, like this is the zero decibel line right here. Wait, how can you, cause like 10 to the third minus 10 squared. So on the decade, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the duck, this is a semi-log scale. So it's, it's a special scaling where, actually I have it over here you see that the distances get compressed as you move towards the right. But the distance between 10 to the zero, 10 to the one, we call that a decade. And so decades, we make those evenly spaced. Like even anything that's 10 times 10 apart will be equally spaced. Like here, this line represents, uh, so this is 10 to the zero, so this is one. This line represents two. Two is gonna be, so 20 is over here. So the distance between 20 and two, that's a decade, because two times 10 is 20. So the distance between two and 20 is the same as the distance between 10 and one. So you have to run it through a log before calculating with this unit. Well, um, yeah, if you want to generate this visual, like if I wanna, because I'm talking about slope as minus 20 decibels per decade. 20 minus 2 equals 10 minus 1. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Those are equal to the same thing. Um, oh, right. I was going to say, I was going to say that this height here is equal to 20 log base 10 of k this number in the numerator of the transfer function okay so i want to show you i want to show you this i want to show you this let's go back over here so this is this is going to be like the final result here what I have here is the original data. So we run some experiments. We get the amplitude ratio at different frequencies. Then if you plot the amplitude ratio in terms of decibels, so to convert to decibels, you take the log 10, you multiply by 20. The shape looks like this. 
that shape looks very similar to the shape that that first order transfer function gives. So you can fit the data with a transfer function. So it's kind of like a, a regression, but it's for a dynamic system. Uh, and that's why we call it system identification. System identification is like curve fitting, but it's curve fitting for a dynamic system. Aren't there particular functions we can use to generate Bode plots from the transfer function? Yes, yes, certainly. And I, I used that in here, I believe. So if we were going to do this experiment for a random generic system, would we need to calculate the data near the corner frequency? Yes. So when you're designing your experiment, you're gonna make sure that you test frequencies near this corner because in advance, you don't like, when you're doing an experiment, you don't know what the model is in advance. You don't know where, where the corner is gonna be. So you're gonna have to test a bunch of points and, and make sure that you, you get data around the corner. Is random generic system a technical term? Uh, no, I think it's just saying if you if you do this, if you want to apply this to something other than a motor, what would you do? Um, okay, so like the way that I fit this, so looking at this part over here before the corner, I'm going to zoom in. You see that the height of this above zero, it's at six. So it's at six decibels. So this height here, it was equal to six. So if I go down here, I'm gonna say like, okay, that amplitude six is equal to 20 log base 10 of K. So that would mean that log base 10 of K is equal to six over 20. And then just doing some log math, I would say K is equal to 10 to the six over 20. And then you would plug that value back in here. And then if I wanna figure out the corner frequency, well, that's where the corner occurs in the graph. <laughs> Is God a system? Does he respond to your prayers? If yes, then he responds to inputs and he has outputs, he is thus a system or she. Very well said, Erebus. Okay, the most accurate way to figure out where the Dr. E is God, uh, no, I am certainly, I'm certainly not. The most accurate way to figure out the corner, I wanna show you this, because we haven't talked about the phase plot yet. This is the last thing we'll do. So if you plot the phase angle for that particular transfer function, so this is the transfer function, k over one over omega c s plus one. Uh, at the corner, actually I'm gonna like project this down here. Let's say this is where omega is equal to omega c. At the corner, the phase is gonna be equal to minus 45 degrees. So probably the most accurate way to determine what omega C is for your transfer function, you plot the, um, you plot the phase angle of your data and you try to as closely as you can identify the frequency where that phase was at minus 45 degrees. I'm the Bob Ross of controls. I would prefer that. I would love that. Um, I love Bob Ross. Maybe the real system is the friends we made along the way. Um, Okay, I know we've run a little bit over time and I've gone over like a wide swath of material here, but I hope we captured somewhat the scope of this procedure. Like, 
Um, so you collect frequency response data. You generate a log plot of the amplitude ratio. You do the same thing with phase. And when you collect your data, you're going to recognize that it makes a, a certain shape. And different shapes are fit very well by different transfer functions. So this shape is just, it just happens to be a very well-known uh, uh, shape. So what is God's transfer function? I mean, you know, transfer functions, I was going to say they're only for linear systems. Is that true? I think it is. Is God a linear system? Oh my gosh. I don't think so. Um, in coming weeks, we're going to do, we're going to do lab. We're going to do another lab and I want to show you, wait, let me pull this up really quick. Just as a sneak peek, as a sneak peek. Where's this? We're going to fit more complicated systems with transfer. I, I just want to show you this because there's many different typical shapes that we can make with transfer functions. And when you collect data from systems out in nature, it's kind of fascinating that the frequency response, it looks like transfer functions that we know. And I know if you take Mook's class, he likes to assign homework problems where you try to fit data with transfer functions. And that's a very real life type of problem to do. This transfer function happens to be for a flexible beam. Um, and the, the input to this transfer function is the angle of this arm at the base. And the output is the deflection of um, the tip of the beam. Is that the spanking machine? Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of looks like that, doesn't it? But all that to say, like, um, it ends up with this transfer function. Is that from a research paper that's published? No, this is from a lab that you're going to do in this course. This is the next lab we're going to do. You're going to do this. You're going to do better than read it. You're going to do it yourself. It's going to, it's the machine that slaps a chicken to perfect cookness. I saw that Matt Burge sent me that video and it's amazing. There's somebody that cooks the chicken by building a slapping machine that just hits the chicken and it stores heat from the slap. It's, it's crazy. Um, no, this is, um, like here, this is the shape of like a second order transfer function. Here's the, the natural frequency. And then this one, Actually, this is from the same system. It just goes out to more frequencies. Uh, so you have a peak that goes above. You have a peak that goes below. Do you remember what a peak that goes down represents? This is a throwback to 340. It's a, it's a one of the more advanced concepts. Dr. E, Dr. Burge collab. People have mentioned that I, I need to get them on. Um, we need to get them on the stream. We need to get them in here. Minimum phase system. Not necessarily. Well, like when you see a peak that goes up, that is indicative of complex conjugate poles in your system. All right, and when you have a peak that goes the opposite way, that means you have complex conjugate zeros in your system. 
so like just looking at this system i mean i've already analyzed this but i mean you can do the same thing like i know that okay i have two complex conjugate poles with a natural frequency here i have another pair of complex conjugate poles for this peak and their natural frequency is here and then i have two complex conjugate zeros that have a frequency here so the number of poles you have in your system is the like the order of the system so this is at least fourth order um, we have a slope going up right here which uh hold on oh right 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 Zero. And then what's the slope of this right here? I think that's like 40 decibels per decade. So like, it, it's like a little puzzle. These are actually fun puzzles to do. It's, it's pretty amazing to me that that you can model that, that these kinds of things happen in nature and we have really good models for it. Um, wow, we went like way over today. But hope you enjoyed it. I enjoy chatting with you guys. Random question, is there a textbook for flight dynamics or any resources I should look at beforehand? Now, the thing with flight dynamics Burge Collab for 444 Thermal Control System. I like it. No, the thing with Flight Dynamics is it's hard to find one textbook that does a really great job. But I have found a PDF that I really, really like. If you email me, I can send it to you. What it is, it's a set of notes from a professor at Cornell, I believe. And it's somebody who's been doing flight dynamics for like decades. Something like four decades or something. Somebody who's been doing it for like 40 years. I'm pretty sure. And this professor has just like, I think dialed it in. And it's not a textbook per se, but it could be a textbook. It's just very clean course notes and I love it. So if you email me, I can send it to you. And I can also send you the syllabus which lists some other books that are pretty good. Awesome, will do, okay, cool. Project listed something earlier. An Arduino IDE for the for the 21st century or something. What was it? Hey, have a great weekend, Erebus. Thank you for your insight. I appreciate it. I'll have to remember I'll have to look that up again. But that sounded interesting. Platform IO.
All right, everybody. I'm going to head out. It's been a pleasure. Have a great weekend.